Okay, we have an amazing show for you today. First up, I interview Fad Ananta for Angel Season 6. He runs Roach Ventures. Get it? Cockroach Ventures. Uh, founders with grit who will never give up. And he shares some really honest insights about raising your first venture fund. He did 25 angel investments, and then he raised, you know, somewhere around a $5 million fund, and he's in the midst of deploying it. Lots of lessons there. And it's Friday, so producer Rachel, Rachel Reporting is back with another edition of OK Boomer, and she understood the assignment. Stick with us. It's going to be a great show. Season six of Angel is brought to you by Our Crowd Helps You Invest Early in Pre-IPO Companies Alongside Professional VCs. If you're interested in investing, you can join our crowd for free at OURCROWD.com slash angel. In Broker's startup insurance program helps startups secure the most important types of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Save up to 20% off of traditional insurance today at embroker.com slash twist. While you're there, get an extra 10% off using offer code twist. And LinkedIn Marketing. To redeem a $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash angel pod. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode six of Angel Season 6. This is the uh, series we do as an extension of This Week in Startups, where we talk to capital allocators, a fancy word for angel investors, seed funds, and venture funds, even syndicates and uh, accelerators could be considered part of capital allocation. What do capital allocators do? They um, pull together some pool of capital, and they look for opportunities to invest it in high growth companies in the venture space, private company space. We're looking for very high growth companies because most startups fail. Uh, you can look at them as experiments. That doesn't mean the founders are failures. It just means that experiment failed and they move on to the next experiment. Typically, we see founders on their second, third, fourth one. They, they can get on base or even hit a home run. And so it's very exciting to be a capital allocator. And one of the most exciting things over the past decade, and I'm in my 11th year now of investing, is that investing in startups and creating funds has been massively democratized. We're seeing many, many, many more people uh, start their own funds, start their own syndicates where groups of people get together and invest. And we're seeing a ton of diversity, people from different backgrounds, different regions, genders, ethnicities. It's absolutely fantastic to see this kind of massive change. And, and it's been great uh, in doing this series. The five um, interviews we've recorded already, Mac uh, Conwell, Mac the VC from Rare Breed, David Rosenthal from Kindergarten, uh, Packy McCormick from Not Boring, Paige Finn Darty from Behind Genius Ventures, and she's like 23 years old, Monique Woodward. Uh, a good friend of mine who was at 500 Startups, which is now called 500 Global, an incubator here in Silicon Valley, and she has Cake Ventures. So we've been having this incredible parade of capital allocators. Some of them are on their first fund and did venture before. Other ones, it's their first time in venture and their first fund. Really amazing. When I came into the industry 20, 30 years ago, if you wanted to join a venture fund, man, you had to be out of Harvard and, you know, and get your MBA out of HBS, Harvard Business School or Stanford. Uh, GBS, Graduate Business School, maybe Wharton. And it was kind of an insider's game. You know, your fraternity brother basically got you the job or your dad or a cousin or something. Now, completely democratized and everybody's figuring it out. Today will be no different. Uh, in my little pre-interview with today's guest, he said, I'm figuring it out. And I said, you know what? Me too in decade two. It's uh, not an easy job. So, Fad Ananta, please tell me I got your name perfect. Yes, yeah. You got uh, it. Thank the Lord. You know, it's very weird. They have sometimes uh, there'll be a name that's incredibly challenging to pronounce, and I nail it. And then other times it's incredibly simple, and my producers are just beside themselves. And uh, uh, Fad uh, is, and it's, it's spelled F A H D, if you're wondering, uh, is a general partner at Roach Capital. You heard that correct, as in cockroach. Uh, and I, I'm guessing you named your fund after the phenomenon of the cockroach entrepreneur, which is the entrepreneur who will never be killed and never give up, correct? Yeah, I think there's some hidden alpha in, um, you know, resilient, gritty founders. Yeah. Uh, and so you were a former founder yourself. You did a SaaS company. You sold it to uh, HubSpot. When did you first 
uh, become aware of angel investing and start doing some angel investing. And then we'll get on to uh, when you decided to move from an angel investor to a fund. We sold the company to Hustle, I think, in 2012 or so. Oh, okay. Um, and then since then, I've kind of been a product manager, worked at Shopify and so forth. Um, and I, you know, the, one of the caveats, Jason, I'm based in Canada. I'm, I'm based in Toronto, Canada. Um, I started to notice as I saw more and more founders here, uh, there weren't a ton of great accessible angel investors or venture capitalists. Um, you know, I think a lot of the VCs here typically come from uh, um, you know, different industries, uh, not necessarily from tech. And so as I started to see it, and I had a bit, a bit of liquidity myself. You mean strategic investors, like it's part of some big company has a little venture arm on the side and they're investing. That or, or it might be like an oil and gas family or like a real estate family that you know, family sees the asset class. Um, but they're not, you know, I don't think they're as like sophisticated as, as like understanding, um, you know, uh, how, how to build a software company. And so as I started to kind of see that type of archetype more and more and more, um, I saw really compelling companies uh, and I just decided to write small checks. Um, and I'd saved up a little bit. I was working at Shopify. And so I started to, I think the first time I wrote a check, I, I didn't know how to write a check. Um, I didn't know like what, like, do you just like ask them like, hey, like, can I invest in your company or do they ask you or what, what that looks like? And uh, so I just kind of just said like, hey, you know, I'd really like to invest in the company. Um, and how much can I write, et cetera. And then you know, wrote, wrote a few checks that way. Uh, that started in 2016. And then over the last uh, four years before I raised the fund, uh, invested in 25 companies myself. Um, and then went on to raise the fund. And when you make those uh, angel investments, you're doing 10, 25, 50K of your own capital, something in that. Yeah. Range. So um, initially I started with 25K um, USD, which is as a Canadian, it's a lot of money. Yeah. And, uh, and I started to size it down a bit more so I could have a like a bigger basket of companies. And as I start to learn a bit more, um, I learned about my investing type, what things I like in certain companies, what things I don't. And um, at some point I started to learn about like the asset class and think of it as asset class. To be very honest, like, I think when I started, um, I thought it was cool. Um, I thought it was a good way to pay it forward. And I thought it was, you know, effectively, you know, tuition on, in a different industry uh, with the call option at the end. So like, it, 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 you know, it might work out and you might get rewarded, but either way I get to learn a bunch about a specific domain that I'm interested in. Yeah, I mean, if you think about getting an MBA, cost a quarter million dollars to go to those schools that I mentioned. And if you were to angel invest 10k in 25 companies, uh, I think arguably you'd learn as much or more than getting your MBA just hanging out with those 25 founders. And you make these, you know, approximately 25 angel investments. At some point, you know, two or three years in, did you have any winners or start to become confident in this? Or were you feeling like some people do in the J curve, people can look that up. But basically in years two or three, your, your investments, uh, it's unclear uh, how you're going to do because some of your early investments will shut down. And so you're in the negative zone. Yeah, uh, so tell me what was it like in years two, three and four for you after making these bets? I think um, I actually got incredibly lucky that some of the first few companies I invested in uh, performed really, really well. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe because I wasn't trying to be an angel investor, I, I tried to meet good founders that are you know, local in Toronto. And uh, some of them I even tried to hire at Shopify and they're like, no, I'm working on this thing. Get to learn about their business. And it's like, can I write 10K? Can I write 25K? So I think the first like two or three companies have um, you know effectively like returned my return and more my entire capital. Um, wow. you know, some of them are some of the like there's uh, at least one unicorn that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, yeah, they they raised the Series C last year, um, so they've performed well. And then I think once I started to feel too comfortable, um, that's when I started thinking about like um, you know a little bit more FOMO, a little bit more hey I should get like access to this type of investment because it's mm. cool. Um, and then I think those types of investments are still TBD in, in figuring itself out. I, you know that is a, a lot of the journey of being an investor is I think if you get lucky on the first couple of investments, you all of a sudden conflate like, oh, maybe I'm good at this. And then it gives you motivation to do it more. And if you get more focused on it, and you're super positive, well, you can get this very positive feedback mechanism going where you meet more founders, and 
you work harder at your job and your luck increases. And I, I think that's possibly what could have happened to you, huh? Yeah, I think um, a, a lot of it was, was probably just thinking that that exact same direction. Um, you know, one thing I tried to do was be a, try to add this like view of like, at the same time, I'm, you know, I'm working as a product manager. Um, so I tried to help out these founders with a bit more product strategy. Um, once I learned that, you know, maybe I'm, uh, yeah, I'm getting a bit too excited uh, about my own luck. Um, I, I wanted to learn a bit deeper about these companies, so I worked closer with them by helping them with their product strategy, get to like know how the founders work, et cetera, and that gives you a bit more conviction in, in when I make the investment. Okay, so you get the angel investor resume dialed in, and uh, you got some wins under your belt. Perfect setup to start a fund. So when did you decide, hey, instead of just taking my own capital and recycling it and, you know, hey, one of these unicorns pays off 50 to one or 100 to one, you can now make another 50 or 100 investments and, and keep that, you know, momentum going. When did you um, make the decision? I want to invest some other people's money and start a fund. Yes, yeah, so I would say um, you know, just to caveat all this, but there's a lot of like serendipity and, and, and luck involved. Um, sure. You know, I happened to work at Shopify during a time the company was in like, hyper growth. Uh, a lot of my friends ended up becoming people who would be LPs in funds uh, because they themselves got, you know, fairly rich and had liquidity. Um, and so I happened to be, I guess, one of the first PMs that left and, uh, you know, I guess started taking angel investing a bit more seriously. Um, mm. And as I started to do that, I started to kind of like think, well, how do I build a brand here in Canada? How do I kind of think of myself as I kind of like do this full time? And uh, a lot of my other peers would come to me as like, how do I do this? How do I learn about angel investing and so forth? And I've learned from other mentors at Shopify as well, and other mentors in the community. And, uh, you know, once that started to happen, some of them were like, hey, do you want to manage my capital for me? Um, you know, do you want to take a little bit of capital here and there? That started to kind of put it in my head. I was always, um, you know, I was always pretty hesitant because I had, I had a view on these like, you know, early stage funds where, you know, I thought, um, I guess like in the long run, um, you know, there's a lot of responsibility involved in like running these funds. And from what I saw from a few funds that, you know, I, I've seen personally, um, I think a lot of capital gets deployed early on into, um, I guess, like hot trending companies. And then a lot of the times like the, um, you know, GPs will go on and go get a job at a larger fund. And then um, the LPs are kind of like in this like limbo state. So I didn't want to do that at all. So I wanted to kind of think about it myself, like, um, do I want to do this long term? Um, you know, will I do fund one, fund two, fund three, uh, if, if I have the right track record? And once I knew that myself and started to learn more and more, I spent about a year actually learning um, closely with a bunch of other funds from early stage to late stage to like crossover funds, um, some hedge funds and, and some real estate funds. And I started bringing some of those lessons back to like early stage um, investing. And then I started kind of like, I guess, exercising the relationships I've built um, with some of those larger finds, uh, with some of the people I met at Shopify. And I started to kind of formalize this idea of like, hey, maybe I want to start a very, very small find um, and you know, set the initial target around 3 million and ended up raising around five um, to kind of take that thesis to the next level. It's time for another R Crowd deal of the week. Right now, you can join R Crowd's investment in future family. According to the deal memo, future family provides millions of families with access to affordable treatment through buy now, pay later financing or BNPL if you're in the industry. And they power 15% of the fertility clinics in the US. And last year, they grew patient serve by 300% according to the deal memo. And you can invest right now in future family at rcrowd.com slash angel. All around the world, companies like Future Family are innovating and driving returns for investors. Our crowd analyzes many of these companies, then they select the ones with the greatest growth potential and they bring them to you. From personalized medicine to health tech, which is tackling the $60 billion global IVF and fertility treatment market. In state-of-the-art labs, startup garages, and anywhere in between, our crowd identifies innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest, and that's early. So here's your call to action. If you're an accredited investor, you can join our crowd for free at ourcrowd.com slash angel and review the current deals that's our crowd.com slash angel to sign up for free so when we look at your journey you build product you sell it to a big company you become a product manager a surging company and everybody around you starts to do well and you have access to companies and maybe there's not that many people investing in toronto so you've got this you know great wide open space to operate in you make 25 bets hey you hit a couple 
And now the momentum's building and the people around you are saying, hey, you know what? I would love for you to manage some of my money. So you decide you're going to pop up this, you know, three, four, five million dollar fund. And uh, tell me about the moment when you closed your first check. Do you remember where you were? Do you remember who it was? The first commitment is always like special yeah, yeah. for your fund. It was actually, uh, you know, funny enough, I got this email one day. So, we, uh, you know, I think there was a feature on like Shopify angels. So again, this is what I mean oh. by the serendipity part. Um, there's a feature on the people that were like leaving Shopify, what the Shopify mafia looks like and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they happened to feature me. Um, and then so this uh, one of the partners at Tiger Global happened to read. Uh -huh. And uh, so then a few days later, I got this email in my inbox, like Tiger Global intro. And um, I thought it was spam. Click on it. Uh, it's one of the partners there. And we, we started going back and forth, started building a relationship, shared some notes about a few companies they were looking at. And from there, um, I think over the course of probably about two months, uh, you know, we both figured out that we probably want to figure out a way to work together. Um, and then I, I kind of went on limb and said like, hey, I want to raise a fine. Um, this is kind of where I'm at. And uh, you know, they kind of like did their own reference checks. Uh, they ran their own little process. Um, and they came back to me and was like, you know, uh, myself and a few other partners uh, want to be the largest LPs in your fund. Um, so that was my first check. I was, you know, I was, I was at home, uh, you know, they gave me a call, they did a few reference checks and they're like, cool, we're, we're in for uh, yeah, this, this amount. Um, will be the anchors in the fund. Um, wow. And then from there, I got a lot of confidence, um, you know, kind of being this like no name, effectively no name angel in Canada, yeah. um, to having one of the largest, um, you know, uh, institutional funds in the world, um, you know, kind of finding that confidence in me. You were anointed. Um, of, you know, it's interesting, your story, similar thing happened to me. Sequoia said, hey, you know, you, you've introduced us to so many great founders, would you like to be a scout for us? Um, and that was the first scout program ever created, you know, just over 10 years ago. And so you, you call it luck. Um, I call it action. I call it energy. Um, I call it, you know, some people might say hustle. I just think it's like when, when you're of action, when you're in the mix, when you're doing things in the world, people get attracted to you. And then opportunities come to you that you might not have ever anticipated. So one interpretation could be luck. My interpretation of what's happening to you is you're doing so much good action in the world that it's attracting uh, people who do good things in the world to you. Tiger's not looking to give you a handout or a donation. Uh, they're looking at you saying, he's going to find something that becomes a unicorn again in Canada. And if we're LPs, we got some early signal. That's, that's their intent, right? When a big fund like that backs a tiny fund. Yeah, of course. And, and just to kind of comment on that, um, you know, uh, I think a lot of it is like planting these seeds. So I spent, you know, 2019, I left Shopify and I spent, um, I was pretty lonely because I had no coworkers. So I spent a lot of time on Twitter. And so every time I had like a thought in my mind, whether it's around like product uh, strategy or investing, I'd share it and start to build this like, audience there. Um, and then from there, I started to meet with a lot of different funds and planting these seeds of like, you know, how do you think about investing? How do you think about building conviction? Um, and then, you know, once you develop these relationships, um, then I think that I can um, you know, go back to them when I'm thinking about raising a fund myself. And, uh, and a lot of them ended up becoming LPs in my fund um, you know, down the road. And I, you know, this is another theme that keeps coming up, uh, Mac as well, um, and other folks. Hey, if you're good at Twitter, all the VCs and investors and founders are hanging out there. You following me, me following you, us talking to another, to talking to Packy, talking to Mac, talking to Monique. Everybody's kind of at the same cocktail party. It's called Twitter. And if you get good at Twitter, uh, you're going to make friends. And if you can write intelligent observations, it may be even a tweet storm or, you know, heck, even do a podcast, you might build your brand up a bit. So how are you thinking about brand building today uh, and building up your brand? So instead of you chasing deals, hey, maybe some deals start chasing you. Yeah, so for me, um, you know, but I think I saw this like Justin Khan video a while back and he basically, I think it was Justin Khan and he basically said like three things. So like, you know, um, as an angel, there's like, as a fund, there's three things you can offer, which is uh, um, uh, capital. I don't have a ton of capital. Um, you know, any other large firm will have more. Uh, brand, um, you know, I'm, I'm one guy running Roach Capital. Uh, I'm not a recent or, or benchmark. And then, um, you know, the other thing is time. And that's probably the one area where I could probably compete. And so for me, it's like, if I can start offering um, you know, good product strategy um, sessions with a lot of these founders I've made for, for just goodwill, that starts to build a reputation. 
um, with a lot of these founders. They might be like, and, and a, a bunch of deals that I've invested in now have been like, hey, like let's let's talk to Fod about you know, how we want to build a product team, how we want to hire our first PM, um, how we want to think about product strategy or growth. And so that's been uh, like one angle of alpha. And the other area is like I've been trying to play up until like up until this time into the area where I have um, less competition. And so in Canada, um, you know, I find that there's not a ton of people, or at least when I started, there wasn't a ton of people at like the early stage doing angel investing, building a brand, working at, um, you know, like, like one of the biggest companies in the country. Um, I think that goes a long way. And then the last thing is um, I never wanted to, you know, pretend to be a VC. I want to be myself. And I think uh, yeah, that, that goes a long way. I've, I've seen the same in, in your work. I've, you know, I've been a big fan of your work, Jason. Um, so I've seen a lot of that. And, and uh, I think that comes across much more natural. It's just like, hey, I'm, I'm just a dude. I've done some work. I have some money. And, uh, you know, maybe we can get along with those cool stuff together. I mean, authenticity and keeping it simple, essentialism, right? Like is a key part of, I think, being successful in life, you know, uh, venture capital aside and capital allocation aside. But in capital allocation, you know, you don't have to overthink this. And I think a lot of people do. You, you have to meet a lot of companies. You have to place a bet on some of them, and then you got to be as helpful as possible to those companies. And if you just do that consistently, uh, you don't need to hit a ton of winners. In fact, you need to hit only one, <laughs> and maybe one per fund, or maybe one every couple of funds. You know, that's a super outlier to, to build a career, and uh, it seems like you're well on your way. So you raised this $5 million or so, uh, just over $3 million or somewhere between yeah. 3 and 5 It's about $5 million. About five million. Congrats! Perfect size. Uh, solo GP. There's not a lot of fees off of that, but it looks like you did okay, and you you, you sold your company. I um, think what I wanted to do, just to kind of comment on that bit, um, I want to align myself with the LPs as well because I think a lot of these LPs are taking a bet on me, and I want to build for the long term. Um, and uh, and I have like a little bit of cushion myself to like kind of make it work and, and bet on myself. So I set it at a 0% management fee and only carry um, because I think if I build a successful fund here, the management fee will not matter. And if I don't, then it also won't matter. Yeah, I didn't do one on my first fund. I kind of regretted it only because I could have had a couple of support staff, uh, like yeah. maybe one or two. Uh, and uh, that would have helped me service founders and LPs better. So uh, my best advice to you on the next one is they want you to take those uh, fees because you're going to pay them back anyway, and it may help you build a little more infrastructure. And you know, when they call, you can respond quicker. Or if you need to do reports, the reports can be better. Yeah, totally. I'm going to quickly explain one crucial type of insurance that all startups need just one E and O insurance. This covers errors and omissions and it helps you scale your business because any major customer that you have is going to ask you, do you have E and O? Show it to me. Let's close this deal. And listen, if you don't have business insurance, you failed one of the first steps of being a founder and startups should look no further than in broker when they're looking to get their insurance dialed in. In brokers, technology saves you time and money. Prices are up 20% lower, better coverage than incumbents. You can go from sign up to quote and purchase in just 10 minutes. It's easy breezy. And when you work within broker instead of the incumbents, you're not dealing with large, slow corporations. Uh. Nope, sign up takes days, not weeks, and the process is completely transparent. There's no opaque pricing. Here's a really easy call to action. To instantly buy custom built insurance for startups, just go to imbroker.com slash twist. And while you're there, you can get an extra 10% off by using the promo code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T. Thanks, and Broker, for sponsoring everything we do here at This Week in Startups and providing assurance to many of my startups. Really appreciate it. So take me through, uh, do you have a specific thesis on verticals, stage, or type of founders? We obviously know on a geo basis, you, yeah. you're, you're, you're it in Toronto, and people are looking for that early stage check. It's a great place to go. But putting geography aside, how do you think about your zone of excellence? Yeah, so I um, tend to be a bit more broad now, or at least that's some my thesis is like fairly broad. Um, it's like early stage companies for the most part um, and uh, building internet businesses that are high growth um, and uh, you know, pretty, pretty open to geo. Like Toronto, yes, I think I have like a good you know, center of gravity here, but kind of across North America and, and um, anywhere else really. Um, and then the other thing I look at is, um, yeah, the namesake of the fund. I, I want to find people that are really, really gritty, and these like roach founders. And uh, you know, that, that term I kind of 
picked up a bunch from like the Paul Graham essays, like hearing about the Airbnb founders. Um, and I think that actually goes a very, very long way. And um, there's a lot of founders that are actually like super greedy and can build a business in the long term that are maybe discounted today. And I think that's where I kind of want to find um, a lot of that value. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, thesis to have. If you're looking for, I always talk about resiliency and grit. And, you know, most startups fail, not because they run out of money, or they didn't get to product market fit, it's because the founders gave up. That's the number one reason founders sometimes will work for a year with no salary, and they pull a rabbit out of a hat. And, you know, optimizing around grit is a really brilliant thesis. Uh, I've refined mine over the years, uh, to be focusing on people who build. So we back builders is my new credo. <laughs> Because all of the success we've had has been around that, right? But I think it's important also for you to figure out who do you like to work with? I get the sense that you are the cockroach founder. You are, in fact, the gritty one. And I think you probably might be annoyed to work with somebody who's incredibly entitled. Am I correct? Yeah, I think um, I, there's actually this fascinating essay that uh, Ho Nam, uh, the founder of Altos, Altos Ventures, um, he wrote, it's called uh, Foxes and Hedgehogs. And, um, you know, I think the, the, you know, the TLDR of it is that there's a lot of people that are foxes that are actually really, really good at fundraising. And then there's a, people that are hedgehogs who are actually like not that good at fundraising. They're not that presentable, but they're just like kind of in the corner, tucked away, like doing their work. Yeah. And I think that's the type of people that I want to you know, try and work closer with. Um, that's the type of people I want to continue to like invest in and, and, and build with. Yeah. They don't have the big fluffy tail and they're, they're not uh, peacocking out there, but they're getting uh, stuff done. Hey, when you look at your um, uh, portfolio and I have it up here, maybe tell me about uh, which company out of all of these has had the most markups valuation increase for you since you invested in them yeah so um actually it's one of the first investments i made at this fund is, is this company called vin uh they're based in victoria bc they're based in building a uh, online car marketplace um they work directly with the dealerships and then over time um you know, they, they become one of the largest sources of referrals to these dealerships um they you know, kind of have a concierge experience for the for the car buyers um and then uh you know there's kind of repeat their playbook for city over city and they're you know looking at expanding more into some of the services uh beyond just buying the car so things like warranty insurance delivery vin auto yeah. vin auto yeah so i i met the founder through um, another friend uh pretty much on that exact same premise which is like they're I think, they're think they were thinking about some product strategy, like how to scale the product team, um, how to think about their product in a more uh, concise way, and how to how to position their, their business. Um, so I met the founder. I spent more time with their with their co-founder, who was the head of product. Um, and over time, we, you know, we built a relationship. I actually ended up building more conviction in the business because I got to see how they work, how they think. And uh, you know, I discovered that they are indeed roaches. Um, and we built a good relationship together. So when they're raising capital, it just happened to line up with um, when I have just started uh, raising the fund. And so they ended up being the first investment on the fund. Um, you know, I invested 200,000 in that company um, out of the fund, which is uh, one of the largest checks. And, um, and then you know, Caleb, who's, who's the CEO, he came to, to dinner in Toronto. Um, and we kind of got to meet with a bunch of other investors. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, they, they've had some markup since, um, since that point. Congratulations on that. And then when you look at all these ideas, which one do you think was the not which one is the non most non consensus? In other words, other investors didn't get it. But you thought, hmm, this has a long chance is long odds for this one, it's going to be a challenging company and a challenging product to build a challenging vision. But if it does succeed, oh, my, it could change the world. Do you have one of those in the portfolio? That yeah, might, that comes to mind. I don't know if they changed the world specifically, but I think it changed the industry. Um, so this is so this is a company called Base Station, and um, it's this founder that I met again. Like he used to work for this company called GFL. Uh, they're like waste management company. Um, I think they're based in Canada. And um, he left. Uh, he he was like working on their corp dev team, and he basically started seeing all these like SMB um, haulers, like these recycling and like garbage haulers. And uh, he realized that a lot of their operations are run on Excel and paper. And so he had wanted to build this like back office management software for these like like, like SMB, like garbage and recycling haulers. 
And, uh, and he set out to build that, he learned how to code, he, he built the first version himself, he did direct sales, he grew the company to 50K um, ARR, and then uh, then went on to, to you know, raise a bit of capital. And I think that's the type of business where, um, I think it's like tremendously undervalued. It could be kind of like positioned across from like one industry, like not just, you know, kind of, um, you know, recycling and waste management, um, maybe to like pest control and some of these like other, other businesses. Um, and I don't think they have a ton of competition in, in that market. So I think one of the non-consensus things there is I think a lot of investors will kind of see that market as like really small or like kind of price sensitive, but there's a lot of adjacent markets where the exact same product can, can map onto. Fantastic. And so looking at this uh, deployment, when do you think you'll be finished deploying the capital and, you know, uh, raising the next fund? What's the next challenge and adventure for you? I think for me, the most important thing is to build a Hall of Fame fund out of this first one. I, you know, I want to build like a three to twenty x here. Um, you know, I think I think everyone does. Um, so so hopefully we, we, we get there. Um, I don't want to rush any deployment. I um, mean, I've I've also learned a bunch, like you know, reading um, stuff from from people like you uh, on oh, Twitter, thank you. Um, just around like you know, vintages, um, you know, investing in like you know, let's say you deploy your entire capital in a certain type of market, um, that that may not work out really well for a fund. Um, and so for me, I want to kind of find good businesses. Um, ideally, if we kind of continue on the same place pace, uh, probably by the end of um, this year or early next year, so about a year from now, um, I think we'll be in a position to deploy the fund. So two years to deploy the fund, basically? Yeah, about, about two, two and a half years. Got it. So 30 months for 3 million, 100k a month, and you're going to do 30 companies, 40 companies, as you thought? Yeah, about 30, 30, 40 companies. Great. So 100k a company, you just got to find one company a month. Yes. To find one great investment, how many do you need to meet with on average? Um, I think sometimes it's a bit like sporadic, especially for someone who's like um, building their brand. Um, and I think sometimes like I won't get a ton of deal flow and sometimes I'll get a lot of like inbound deal flow. Um, I think on average, I'll probably talk to about like, and I want to say like 30, 35 companies a month. Um, you know, some months it's, it's more, it's about like maybe maybe 50. Uh, I was actually going through some of these numbers last night. Um, and then I think one month I only met like 10 companies. Um, and from there, um, again, I think the deployments are also sometimes like, sometimes there's a month where I'll make like, you know, one, two, three investments. And sometimes it's like, you know, a month or two where, where I don't make a single investment. Uh, well, listen, continued success here. Uh, congratulations on uh, going from an angel and getting your first fund up and running. And uh, we wish you luck if you find a great company. And uh, they're looking to do, uh, you know, a little syndicate, uh, you know, another 500k check to 3 million. Email your your new bestie. Uh, you got my email, you got my more following each other slide into my DMs and then let's do a deal. Let's go. Let's do it, Jason. Thanks All for right. having me here. Oh, it's great to have you and, and really con continued success. It's uh, you're off to a great start. I looked through all the companies and uh, I didn't I all of them were very interesting to me. And and most of them are in Canada. Yeah, uh, I'd say maybe about like 30% of them. 30%. Oh, only 30%. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, just looking at them. I was like, hmm, there's a Dow one. Huh? That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Back end for Dow. Is I like that too? And yeah. <laughs> really good stuff. Hey, Tom Eschbacher is here with us again. He's a senior sales manager at LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. And we're talking about their amazing report today in startup marketing, as well as how to use LinkedIn to grow your startup as an angel investor. I like to see revenue early and often from startups. How can LinkedIn help with that? Yeah, the, the short answer is LinkedIn lead gen forms. 89% of our startup advertisers utilize them. And, and I'll tell you why. Think about all the effort that goes into creating interest within a prospect. You have to nail the value proposition, create compelling content, find them and then message them with enough frequency so that they engage. You do all that, you get them to your sign up page and you know how many of them are going to convert? Just 2%. That's so much value that marketers are failing to capture and it's a big reason why LinkedIn marketing and specifically LinkedIn lead gen forms are so popular with startups. So people know a lead gen form lives on LinkedIn, they click one time and boom, the email is sent to the company. By using LinkedIn lead gen forms, you're ensuring they're coming from an audience that you care about. And then we're pulling the information right from the member's profile. So it's great. Your SDRs are going to be thrilled with that info. They're going to want to follow up. That's the improved lead quality. And as you say, Jason, it all takes place in just two taps in the LinkedIn newsfeed. So get $100 off your first ad campaign and get access to that LinkedIn report today in startup marketing. And I want you to get that right now 
at linkedin.com slash angelpod, A-N-G-E-L-P-O-D slash angelpod. Okay, Rachel, it's time for you to shine in your weekly segment where you talk to the next generation, Gen Z, millennials, about the future. Who's on OK Boomer this week? So this week, I got to talk to John Herrick. He is the founder and CTO of Dive Chat. I actually met John when I was at Miami Hack Week a few weeks ago because I made a funny tweet about him. Mm. We were at a social gathering and he had his laptop out at a party and I thought it was really funny. So I videotaped him and that is how we, we met. Dive Chat is a group messaging app for organizations that allows the users to also see events happening within the app. And during Hackathon, that, that app is what we use to converse. And it was really cool just being able to see the events and not having to switch over between like a calendar app or a Facebook invite and GroupMe. Mm. I used GroupMe in college and invites always got lost, especially if you were in club or in Greek life where you have a bunch of events happening all the time. Um, it's also really cool. My favorite feature is you get to react to like these messages as many times as you want with emojis. So you know mm. how you can like heart a message in I'm in um in iMessage. Right. You can uh, react as many times as you want with whatever emoji you want Got in it. dive chat. Yeah. So I well, think that's cool. a big way to get uh, Gen Zs really into yeah. your app is to just uh, you know just take the throttle off the emojis. But what you're saying is, hey, this chat app instead of you having to invite everybody, it's for that geolocation or it's for that specific event. For that specific organization, I believe ah. they are targeting Greek life organizations within colleges. Got it. But at Hack Week, it was a great use. Um, I've been seeing a lot of apps coming up trying to basically annihilate the use of the Facebook invite, which I personally hate because I don't use mm. Facebook anymore. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but you get a Facebook invite mm. and you end up missing the event or not knowing about it to like the day of because you don't check Facebook. Yeah, that's a problem. Right. And another app that I saw killing it in this space is Partyful. I know producer Justin has also checked out Partyful before. Um, their whole tagline is Facebook events for hot people. And I think that's really uh, funny. So <laughs> that's definitely. pretty hilarious. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, this is the problem with Facebook. I think if you think about it on a product design basis, Rachel, is they flooded us mm -hmm. with notifications to get us to engage. And then we're like, this is too much. I got to turn off notifications. So if you play your notification hand too strong, people turn them off. And then for things that they would have actually responded to, like uh, a wedding invite or a Greek invite or something, they basically ruin it because who, who wants to go into Facebook and just get <laughs> annihilated with notifications? I mean, the, the the notification anxiety I get when I open up that app is just like, oh, it's too yeah. much. I totally agree with you. I actually don't have any notifications on for any social media at all because no. I find them all to be really annoying. Partyful definitely also goes against this. Um, we were talking to the dive chat co founder, but I'm plugging party full a lot here. But they use SMS, which mm. is really smart, because I never turn my text notifications off or my calls, no. because what happens if your mom calls you, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. so that's a really cool way. And dive chat has the event feature and the messaging feature for groups. So I feel like a little bit more incentive because there's not any other noise in there. All right, shout out Rachel's mom. She's doing a great job. All right, <laughs> clip this, send it to your mom. She's doing good. What is this? Oh, what I don't know what month you're in now, Rachel, but... Uh, Started in July and it's February. I'm not, I'm not as good right. as mental math as you. So, well, whatever. You're, you're at your six <laughs> months and uh, Rachel's mom, dear Rachel's mom, she's a hard worker. You raised a good kid and she's got great potential. Nothing to worry about with this one. I don't know if you got any siblings. Uh, I can't vouch for them, but I can vouch <laughs> for this one. She's got a bright future in podcasting and reporting. Okay, let's go to OK Boomer. OK Boomer. I understood the assignment. Thank you, everybody, for listening to another segment of OK Boomer. This is Rachel reporting. And today I have on John Herrick from Dive Chat. He is the founder and CTO and has his undergrad and master's degree in CS from UT Austin. Um, not to be confused with the alma mater of previous guest Ben Awad, who went to the University of Texas at Dallas. He made it very clear. He's like, I do not go to UT Austin. I go to Dallas. Um, and previously, before Dive Chat, you interned at some pretty cool places, including um, Microsoft and the company that made Pokemon Go. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And also, it's so funny you mentioned Ben, because literally right before this, I was on GitHub in one of his repositories working with one of his packages. So that's oh, so funny. Oh, no way. Wait, that's so yeah. insane. That's so cool. So obviously, being a technical founder must have, uh, have its pros. Do you think that there are a ton of technical founders in the Gen Z community? It was definitely a lot. 
especially as I'm going to a lot of these in-person networking events, I'm finding a lot of people who have very similar experience to me, who are also Gen Z, really ambitious builders, and it's just really cool to see. That's so awesome. So I guess I'll give everybody else some context. I met John at Miami Hack Week. So that's how I know who is a technical founder. And I made a really funny tweet about him when we were at a social event, and he had his laptop out, and it was really funny. But I actually knew about Dive Chat previous to coming because Dive Chat was what we were using a few days before going to Miami to where everybody was conversing and RSVPing to the different events. Can you talk about what is Dive Chat and why did you decide to dive right into this? Yeah. So Dive Chat is the platform for in-person communities. So the kind of idea is right now in college, if you have a fraternity, if you have any sort of student org, almost all of them are using GroupMe. And GroupMe has been around 10 years. It is kind of dated at this point, and everyone really hates it, but people keep using it anyway. So kind of the goal with Dive is build something that's like GroupMe, that's very simple, easy to use, low friction, but also extremely fun and tailored towards Gen Z. That's awesome. I think my favorite part about Dive Chat actually is being able to see the event aspect of it. Um, I loved going to a bunch of different social events in college because I went to Penn State it's in the middle of nowhere. So the university had a lot of sanctioned events, which was incredible. And it would have been really helpful to have these all in one place um, rather than just on a bulletin board in the dining hall. Um, so I definitely see a use case for this. I think it was really cool when we were at the um, hackathon. Can students currently use this right now? Like, are you guys on the App Store? Yes, we're currently on the App Store. We're partnering with different student organization leaders. There is currently a waitlist code to get on. But if you're interested in getting your organization on board, contact us and we'll be happy to let you on. That's awesome. So how do you guys make money was my big question, I guess, too. So that's one funny thing about consumer that I didn't realize until recently is most business models, you actually need to make money, you need revenue. But for consumer, you actually don't want that, at least at the beginning. Everything matters about users and anything that slows down user growth is basically the death of the startup. So you want to focus all resources on getting as many users as quickly as possible. So any sort of attempts to monetize there end up slowing down user growth, slowing down Mm -hmm. retention, engagement, everything there. So basically, you actually want to hold off from monetizing for at least a few years down the line. (laughs) And then it's so funny. It's so counterintuitive. And then once you reach scale, once you have a larger amount of users, then there's a lot of different ways to monetize. One example is with premium groups. So like the Patreon approach, having Discord communities where you have to pay to enter, just building that premium community model. And then as well, because we have the event side of things, there's a lot of ways to monetize that. I definitely know a lot about that because I have used Slack groups that don't have like the premium Slack. If you don't have the premium Slack, then a bunch of your messages um, from a certain time period, I believe, get deleted. So that is super interesting. How did Dive Chat come to be? Because when I was doing some in-depth stalking of you on the internet, I noticed that you pretty much went to school um, undergrad, grad. I mean, you had your internships here and there, but it looks like you went straight into Dive Chat. Like, what was that process like? Yeah. So there's a really funny story of how it started, actually. I was in university and I met my co-founder in an intro to Buddhism class. And it's so funny. We both just took it as kind of a one-off elective just because we had to do a social science. We met each other through the class. We were studying for an exam. And we started talking entrepreneurship. I mentioned I was doing a hackathon next weekend. He talked about how he had some previous experience at startups. And he said, hey, we should grab a coffee tomorrow or something like that. Now, most Mm -hmm. people, when they say that, they never follow through. And then you never end up meeting. But he actually (laughs) did follow through. He was like, hey, let's go to Einstein's coffee tomorrow at noon. How's that sound? We went there. He pitched me the idea. It was very different back then. But overall, I could sense his incredible enthusiasm, his drive, ambition. And I wanted to work with him. And that's how Dive started. I know we've talked a lot off of the show about pivoting, um, especially looking back on life like one year later and just seeing how in the past, like how could have I even thought that? Like looking back, um, hitting that one year mark, especially maybe as a grad student coming out of school completely, just seeing how far you've gone and how wrong you were going to be. Um, can you talk about how you guys have been able to pivot and many, maybe even some advice you have um, for people that are scared to pivot? Yeah, I didn't realize until I did it. But pivoting is absolutely so important. And that any successful startup is going to need to be able to pivot many, many, many times, if not minorly, then majorly. So originally, Dive was a ticketing platform for college parties. And in retrospect, looking back on that, that's a really bad idea. College students are some of the stingiest market anywhere. And so trying to monetize college parties in particular won't really work. And then we pivoted towards kind of an event discovery app, which every single college student has tried. But event discovery apps don't really work either just because people aren't checking them. So then we thought, what has really good retention? What app do people check all the time, which is messaging? But then messaging is also an incredibly crowded space. So then how do we innovate on messaging when there's so many other messaging apps, when there's so many other 
startups that have tried in this space and failed. So now we have kind of this hybrid approach of the hole in the market. It's kind of like Slack and Discord, but for parties, for social, for Gen Z mm-hmm. and consumer that hasn't really been filled before. And that's kind of our unique take on it. And then leaning into that, just having really good design and making it really fun for Gen Z in particular. I've decided that the one app, if I could just have somebody come in and redo the whole thing, it's Fidelity. It's like a, a finance app, like I just do my retirement account in it. And the usability of it is so bad that it makes me not ever want to use the app. Your guys' app is incredible. It's really pretty to use, um, hasn't crashed on me yet or anything. And it's funny that you mentioned ticketing apps and things like that, because I actually, there's only one app that I know that's ever really worked with ticketing and it's Line Leap. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, I think again, it was one of those startups that might have like come into inception off of college students, but I don't know if that's like Penn State specific or not. It's just such a hard area to break into. Another one that's really difficult is to see, um, that I've seen students like try to iterate a lot on is like how crowded restaurants or bars are in the area. So, you know, when to come. So dive chat, obviously being able to integrate two crucial parts, I feel like has made you guys really fun to have, especially at places like Hack Weeks. Um, definitely would have been very, very helpful for me in college. Have you guys ever used this at any other events outside of Hack Week? We have one really large group for kind of just Gen Z tech Twitter as a whole. Oh, cool. That group has around 400 people. And that's a really fun group for us, just because it's a lot of our friends, a lot of people in the tech community, as well as a lot of other founders. So when we're looking for feedback on the app and being critical in UI, UX and everything there, people who have been doing that for years and years and years, all being located in that one group is just really fun for us. That's awesome. So I did not realize that although it feels like a very large community when you first enter, I've noticed that as we continue to go to different social functions to different events, I see you at all of them. And it's kind of like the same group of people. Um, Like I'm sure that everybody in that dive chat, it's kind of like just a subset of those that group of people that um, continues to like come up on my radar as like Gen Z kids in the tech and VC community. A lot of people have different thoughts on what the community of founders is like. What are your thoughts? I've been consistently blown away with how nice and how giving the Gen Z founder community has been. Honestly, it just seems like everyone wants to help everyone out. Everyone wants everyone to succeed. Anytime I'm going to these events and meeting people, almost always they'll say, hey, how can I help? Can I introduce you to this person? They have expertise. They might be able to help you out. Just the amount that they're willing to give in terms of their personal network, their connection, and even their time has been absolutely amazing to see. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. I always tell people I like squat at the WeWork because I don't have a WeWork pass, but there's so many people in like the tech community that do that everyone's super welcoming. And it's like very much like, oh, let's co work together and um, being able to have that support, especially like I said before, like especially because the group isn't that small, like the Gen Z founder community, you know, few and far between. Um, They're incredibly supportive. And I think it would be a really sad place if we weren't all connected together. So very happy that I met you. Um, I kind of want to like pivot a little bit here. And speaking of pivoting, um, I have been doing a lot of research on remote work, um, async communication, especially in the workplace. This weekend startups, we are all remote. I very much like that. Don't think I would have moved to San Francisco right after college. Um, I'm from the East Coast, my family's here. So I enjoy being a remote worker because I think it provides a lot of opportunity. And I've been seeing a lot of commotion as well about async communication. What are your thoughts on async communication? More importantly on that though, how can we make it easier? Async is so important, especially now. So Dive started with me and my co-founder in person at university. But since then, we've basically been living in different cities. And all our employees, everyone else working on it has also been in different cities. So basically, everything in the company is online, everything's remote, and everything's through Slack. And that is really drilled into me the importance of async communication, being able to over communicate as opposed to under communicate and do so really concisely to the entire team has proven extremely valuable just to make sure there's no miscommunications that everyone's on the same page for everything. And then one other thing I'm really passionate about is cutting down on meetings. Any friend I talk to who works at Microsoft or Big Tech or any of those companies there always complains about meetings and how they have way too many meetings. (laughs) All the meetings don't have clear agendas. They don't get stuff done. So one thing that I'm really particular about is having really efficient meetings. If a meeting can be done async, then moving it to async as much preparation that can be done as well, moving it to async. So oftentimes we'll have standups in the morning and we'll cover everything so well async that the standup itself is only five minutes. It's a quick check in and that we're able to get most of it done without using people's time in meetings. I love that. I think being control, um, as Molly Wood says, like her time is her greatest asset. Molly Wood is our co-host. And I 
it made me think a lot more of about my own time now that she's come to the show and uh, she's been reiterating that to us and I definitely agree my favorite memes have been lately like this could have been an email but um now in in 2022 this could have been an email even emails sometimes I'm like oh this could have been a slack like going one step further like I've noticed that like our abbreviation with communication is going further and further and further to the point where it's almost like in order to create um, all like a well-functioning team how much communication is needed obviously that's based on team to team um i like do you ever see yourself as a team though going in renting out an office space because i do think that human can meet communication and human interaction is important just for humanity like to not go insane like working siloed in my bedroom alone sometimes gets a little crazy do you ever think about you guys getting office space we've definitely thought about it a lot in the past and there's definitely that extra spark that happens when doing collaborative work in person. I think especially creative work when brainstorming and bouncing ideas back and forth, that being in person is extremely valuable. And it's oftentimes those little moments, like when you're both grabbing lunch and then you have an idea and then you start talking about that idea, how those little moments kind of spark into really great ideas that you don't capture through a Zoom meeting that's forced 30 minutes blocked off at either end. So from that aspect, it's extremely valuable. So if we didn't get a remote office or if we didn't get an office in person, what we could do is have a bunch of retreats. So office space turns out is really expensive, which I didn't really know until <laughs> I started looking into it. But it's around the same cost of doing some just really cool retreats throughout the year. And those retreats offer a time to basically do the same type of work in the office, except a more memorable experience there. So those are kind of the two options. And we're thinking about that now. That's so cool. So how often do you see your co-founder? I see my co-founder every few months. We bounce okay. around different cities a lot just because everything's remote and we have full flexibility. We like to travel a lot. So I'm actually going to be seeing him next week in Colorado. He's running a little ski house right now. I'll be dropping in for a week. Then he'll be doing a house in LA later this summer. I'll probably drop on by. He'll probably drop on by New York. So we definitely make sure to see each other in person still. That's good. And I know you're based in New York like myself as of now. Um, although like you've obviously popped around a lot. Do you think that uh, you have to be in a particular city in order to get integrated into the tech world as a Gen Z? Or do you think that we can solely survive off of platforms like Dive Chat? In-person community, I think, is really, really valuable. And that's one of the main kind of guiding theses of Dive Chat is that in-person community is more powerful than digital community. And by building for these orgs that are already in person that have a really tight in-person aspect, like fraternities and sororities, we double down on that. So I would say for someone wanting to break into the Gen Z tech community, it dramatically helps to be either in SF, LA, New York, or Miami, just because those are the cities where it's really happening. That is slightly mitigated, though, by Twitter, and that the Gen Z tech Twitter community is absolutely thriving. <laughs> violent. It is, violent. It is crazy. The people, <laughs> I meet people who aren't yeah. in tech, and then I tell them about this phenomenon where everyone in yeah. Gen Z tech is on Twitter, and it is the go-to yes. platform at networking events. They just don't <laughs> believe me. It's absolutely crazy. So because of Gen Z Tech Twitter, I met so many people online before meeting them in person. Like at Miami Hack Week, I met at least a dozen people. I'm like, oh, I know you from Twitter. And then I would meet other people and they're like, oh, I know you from Twitter, which is so funny. So because of Twitter, I think it's much more possible now more than ever to be connected to that scene, even without being in one of those big major tech cities. <laughs> it's so funny. Again, so I went to Miami Hack Week with you that's where i met you um i didn't i was kind of actually hesitant to tell people like where i worked that i was at this week in startups just because i wasn't a founder i wasn't in tech so i was like you know what i'm just not gonna tell i'm just gonna wait till people ask me it comes up in conversation um i was looking to record with people too while i was there i got the awesome um tap co-founder on um eric button before he was a great person to speak with but i wasn't really like telling people like what i did for for work or anything like that i was just kind of like showing up places and talking to people to see who would be interesting to have on the show I even with that, even with kind of like trying to ride like on the down low, I went to Miami Hack Week with 300 followers and I left with 1000 because everybody on tr is on Twitter. I was just talking to somebody about how we should pivot the recruiting platforms like and start going to these different hackathons and events and then um, pinpointing these people, mostly software engineers on Twitter, because I think it is just an incredible place to try to find um, not only like a co-founder if you're young, but also trying to hire in the tech community. Were you guys able to hire at all? Or was that a part of your agenda when you guys were at Hack Week? Definitely currently on our horizon. We're currently looking for some full stack engineers. But I totally agree with that sentiment. Anytime I'm meeting someone in person and I say, how do you want to connect? And they say LinkedIn. 
I kind of shake my head internally because Twitter really is what's happening right now. I completely agree with that sentiment that the best people you're going to find either on Twitter or in person at these networking events. Yeah, I didn't realize how important in por- in person networking was because when I graduated, it was 2020. I came here to New York, and now it feels like because you say yes to one thing, you're actually saying yes to three every time you meet someone in person. And when you say yes to a Zoom call, which is virtual, it doesn't open necessarily any other doors except for maybe another Zoom call. Just not that same communication you get. Has Dive Chat been performing well, even since students have been traditionally not attending college as much as they used to? Yes, I think even though college is online, that makes people kind of strive for in-person community now more than ever. So people that are in fraternities that are in sororities, they're placing even more importance on that because now that's even a larger percentage of their in-person interaction from day to day just because they're not seeing other students in classes. So those in-person communities that people are already integrated into are even more of a part of their lives. That totally makes sense. So are people at UT currently using this platform? Yes, we have a few different Greek orgs at UT that we partner with. Awesome. And what has been the best thing that they've liked about Dive Chat so far? The number one thing I hear over and over again is about our reaction system. So unlike any other messaging app, you can actually react as many times as you want. So like if you have a heart emoji and you really love a message, you can just keep pressing that heart emoji until it's 10, 20, 30, 40, as high as it goes. And everyone can be doing that. And and every time you press it, there's a little explosion. So hearts fly across the screen that other people, if they're in the chat, they can see that. So it's created these really magical moments where you have maybe 10 people in the chat. They're all reacting at the same time. And everyone's screen is just absolutely blowing up with heart emojis, which is so, so fun. I love that. I love that. It's it's like the little things, right? So you said Greek life is pretty heavily uh, integrated on your platform. What's your guys' marketing partnership strategy to bring people and like groups onto the app? Um, like you said, you have codes. I believe that's how I got in. I found like the Miami Hack Week code um, and that was introduced into that community. There was a code also for the tech community, like you said. Um, how are you reaching out to these people and giving these people though the, the access? Right now, it's a lot of warm intros through social chairs of Greek life. So for example, we'll go to the social chair of a fraternity and say, hey, here's this thing. It's like GroupMe, but 10 times better. And the social chair has been used to using GroupMe and they'll throw parties and then people miss the message. And so there's a lot of frustration, especially by the organizers with GroupMe. So if they find kind of this solution that makes everything a lot easier on their part, it makes it easier on the members part. A lot of times they're willing to try it out. And then once the fraternity is on board, they'll end up loving it. Then we'll have a really good relationship with them and they can enter us to other social chairs of other fraternities. So that's kind of been how our marketing has been progressing. Yeah, the, so- <laughs> the network of social chairs throughout State School Greek Life. I know this would perform. Super excited for this to get to Penn State. I know it's going to perform really well there. We have these things called like THON orgs, which are student run uh, philanthropy organizations that always have um, little, I mean, philanthropy events like throughout the year in order to raise money for the big one. Um, like the total, they do like a dance um, marathon where they stand for almost 48 hours and they raise a lot of money then. But um, all the money that they're kind of collecting throughout the year is like presented at the end of that dance marathon. Um, and they host so many events. Like I know Dive Chat would absolutely freaking kill it. Producer Justin, who is another producer on the show, ha- also had a question on kind of the college realm. So we see all these Gen Z founders dropping out. We obviously met a lot of them when we were at Hack Week together. Why did you decide then to make college students your target audience? College students have a very tight sense of community and very similar values. And because we're building for in-person communities, we wanted to start with kind of the best example of really tight in-person communities that are really, really kind of dedicated to their community. And Greek life is just a really strong example of that. Greek life has been around for so many years at this point. People in fraternities have their brotherhood that goes even as they get to late ages, they'll meet people in their fraternities that are younger. And there's just that kind of link between all sorts of different ages and just a really tight community. So because of that, because we are college students ourselves and we relate very much to them, we thought it would be a really good kind of target beachhead market. That's awesome. And I guess at Penn State, there's been a lot of talks about like banning Greek life um, as a whole. Are you guys ever worried that the use case in your target audience might um, like cease to exist on college campuses in the next like few years? I think Greek life is here to stay. Even as much as people want to get rid of it, I think there's definitely a lot of bad in Greek life. I think there's a lot of good in it as well, especially in the community aspect and lifting each other up there. And even if Greek life were to go away, there's still a bunch of other different opportunities in college, like student government, for example, is a really tight knit group, student athlete organizations, and then just 
broadly, any sort of student organization as a whole that meets in person is a good use case. Awesome. That's so cool. Do you have any advice on community building? Because it seems like that is a huge focus of your guys' time. Yes. Yeah, so at the very beginning, one slight pivot we made is we originally wanted to build an app to help people build communities. And we realized that that wasn't really a good idea. And it has been tried many, many times before and failed. And it all kind of ties into the realm of habit changing. If you try and build an app that changes people's habits, it is very hard to do successfully. And you're going to need a lot of mm -hmm. momentum. And it's a lot easier to build an app that already aligns with what people's habits are, and then helping that out. So instead of helping people build their own communities by targeting more established communities and building tooling for them, we found that that's been a lot more successful. Awesome. I think that is super incredible. And thank you so much for being able to uh, come on and talk about Dive Chat. I'm super excited to see where you guys go. Again, like I said, cannot wait till you hit more college campuses. I think this is a really awesome tool that's going to benefit a lot of Gen Z organizations and and maybe like older people's gener like organizations too. I don't know. I don't know what's out there. Where can people find you? And what is your Twitter handle? Twitter is definitely the best place to find me. It is the John Herrick. H-E-R-R-I-C-K. I do fun little random side projects that I'll occasionally tweet about as well. But definitely shoot me a DM and always happy to hear from anyone. Oh, now you need to say some of the fun little side projects. My favorite one I made is, you know, when you're at a restaurant and you're trying to split the check with three friends and you have to figure out how yep. much people owe and there's tax and tip and it's super annoying math and it takes around two minutes to do. Super yep. annoying. There's a bunch of apps that try and fix it. All of them have really bad UX. And so I thought, what is the quickest way I could possibly solve that problem? And so I made an app where you can do all that math in less than 15 seconds and figure out who is who what. So I use it absolutely every single time. Super, super <laughs> fun. And just little random ideas I have that I decided to build out. Uh, what's the app's uh, name? No hard name. I called it QuickPay. Okay. It's not available anywhere okay. right now, but potentially in the future. That's so sick. Well, thank you so much for being on. That sounds cool. Let's try to get that to the App Store too. I know I would love that. I've been using uh, uh, Splitwise, I think it is. And like you said, not super fun <laughs> to use. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, John. And can't wait to hear what Jason thinks about this interview. Thank you so much for having me.